Welcome to the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership YouTube and Odyssey channel. Today, I am joined by Nikki Gulser, the author of Stock and Defenseless. She is also Executive Director at the Crime Prevention Research Center. Ms. Gulser, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me on, Keith. I appreciate it. Of course, we are so happy to have you. Uh, how would you explain what gun control really is and why do you oppose it? I don't think it, um, it helps anyone um, that's a, a good, decent person. Uh, you know, gun control, the government, basically, I feel like the government wants individuals, uh, citizens of this country to be completely reliant on the government, even for protection. And, the, you know, the leftists believe that guns are evil. Guns are bad. Guns cause crime. Um, guns are the reason that we have violence. And that's simply not true. Um you know, out of all of the violence that happens, uh, guns are actually not a huge um, player in that in that violence. Um, but gun control, unfortunately, leaves uh, good law abiding people helpless. And you have to stop and ask yourself, who's most likely to follow gun control laws? Is it the good law abiding people or is it criminals, bad people, those with evil intent, you know, penalties? really matter to someone like myself or, or you. Uh, we don't want to get in trouble with the law. We don't want to go to prison. Um, but, you know, someone with evil intent, uh, someone who wants to harm others, you know, if you've already decided uh, to murder innocent people, I don't, I don't think those penalties are really going to matter. Certainly. You know, it, it's amazing. The left will say things like, oh, we're, we're so anti-gun. We're just for peace and all this stuff. Unless you uh, maybe don't want to chip in for their education system. But then the cops are coming to your house. Grandma's going to jail if she doesn't pay property taxes for whatever he wants. So they're so anti-gun, yet so pro-gun when it comes to uh, funding the things that they want. Or when it comes to supporting uh, Antifa rioting in our neighborhoods, then violence is okay. Uh, when it comes to the concept of self-defense, a lot of people like Bill Maher will say, well, look, either your gun is like on you all the time, in which case it's super dangerous. You're more likely to kill yourself uh, on accident or kill maybe a child. And if it's stocked away in a safe where it, sh where it should be, then it takes forever to get to. So under no circumstance are firearms really for self-defense for the individual. How do you respond to that mindset? Uh, that's simply not true. Uh, the Crime Prevention Research Center, the organization that I work for, we're a nonprofit, and we look at changes in laws, in particular gun laws, and um, see how that impacts crime rates um, when those laws you know, shift and change. And what we have found is that the more good law-abiding people that carry guns for their own self-defense, that own guns, uh, the less crime that you see. Um, you know, <laughs> there are many, many stories out there of, you know, true, justifiable self-defense, defensive gun use stories. They happen every single day in this country, but the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about that. You never see that on the mainstream media. You know, they do cover it in local news. And I go out and I search for these stories online. And I, I post those up on our website at crimeresearch.org uh, on a regular basis to show the public that, yes, there are defensive gun use cases and they happen all the time. Innocent lives are saved because good people had a gun, knew how to use it. And they were able to save good people. Uh, so I don't believe that guns are evil. I believe that, you know, a gun is as good as the person that's holding it. And uh, do I want bad people to have guns? No, I, I don't. But you know what? Maybe bad people shouldn't have vehicles. Maybe bad people shouldn't have access to knives or baseball bats. I mean, anything can be used as a weapon, quite frankly. And it disturbs me. When I see all of these stories on the news where murderers are being let out of prison, you know, COVID hit and they started letting violent offenders out of prisons. You know, police are told to stand down. We see riots and mobs and 
you know, prosecutors not actually charging violent criminals. And, you know, people are wondering why gun ownership is increasing. I'm like, because people are scared. People are concerned. They see what's happening and they realize they need to be able to protect themselves and their, their loved ones and be their own first responder. The book is Stalked and Defenseless. Ms. Gosar, could you give us a little background to this book, what, what it's about, and uh, what motivated you to uh, write this? Sure. Um, back in 2009, my husband, Ben, was brutally murdered right in front of me by a man who was stalking me. And because of Tennessee state law at that time, um, I had to leave my legal permitted firearm that I normally carry for self-defense. I had to leave it locked inside of my vehicle because Ben and I were in a restaurant that was a gun-free zone. So I followed that law, that gun control law. And I'll probably wonder for the rest of my life if I could have prevented that. Of course, I'll never know because I was denied a chance. I was stalked and defenseless. The man that was stalking me did not have a permit to carry. He brought a gun in illegally into a gun-free zone. And when I asked management to please remove him, but, you know, I said, I need help. This man is stalking me. Can you please get him out of here? And when they confronted him to ask him to leave, he pulled a 45 from a shoulder holster under his jacket and shot Ben in the head and Ben fell to the ground. He stood over Ben and continued to fire six more rounds into him. Um, people, people never really think that something like this can happen to them. Um, it's something that you see on the news. It happens to other people, but I'm here to tell you that it can happen to you. And I, I don't want people to be paranoid but I do want them to be prepared because you just never know when evil will decide to pay you a visit. I am so sorry to hear this horrible story. Thank you for uh, finding a silver lining in this and uh, bringing to attention uh, su such a uh, s serious issue and getting to the heart of it. Uh, when it comes to uh, what uh, people will say is, look, th the reason all these people have access to guns is because we're flooded with guns because of all this gun freedom. So with all this gun freedom, you have a lot of weapons manufacturers making guns and it makes it easier for crazy people to get guns. So the equation is more gun freedom equals more likelihood that bad people will get guns. Therefore we need less gun freedom. What do you say to that mindset? No, I don't I don't agree at all. Um, Look, there's always going to be evil people in the world, unfortunately. Um, I don't think that guns cause crime. Some people say, well, it makes it easier. I, I don't think so. I think that uh, guns are used by far more by good people to save innocent lives than they are used in really horrible, evil ways. Um you know, if we want to do something about the violent crime in this country, then we need to get serious about our, our criminal justice system and, um, you know, making sure that offenders are, are locked up and they actually face real penalties that matter. Um, you know, this man that did this to Ben and I, he was only sentenced to 23 years in prison. And they told me it would be 100% with no parole. But that was a lie. Victims are lied to every single day in criminal courts across this country. Many pe people don't realize that murderers are allowed to earn early release good behavior credits. So this man has earned three and a half years of early release. He's going to be let out in 2028. That's going to be here before I know it. I mean, and that is terrifying for me, especially since I found out he's been stalking me from prison. This man has been sending me twisted love letters for years from prison. That's a felony. That's felony federal stalking. So he's still committing crimes. He's doing it from behind bars and they're going to allow him out. Why in the world are we rewarding people like this and letting them out early? 
Yeah. It's amazing. It, it's it's like no standards for people who commit the most heinous crime. But if you try and build a deck on your house without a permit, watch out. They're coming for you. You will not be able to escape this. It, it, this is just uh, su such terrible uh, quality of uh, service in this uh, justice system. Uh, when it comes to the Australia case, this is usually the bulletproof case of, see, Australia implemented gun control on what they call assault rifles in the greatest misleading way possible. Australia implemented gun control. Gun violence went down. Therefore, gun control is morally justified and works. What do you say? No, I don't agree. <laughs> no. No. Uh, has uh, the Crime Prevention Research Center uh, d done any research in the Australia case or uh, any of the countries that are always thrown in our faces? Uh, when uh, they want the state to monopolize guns? Yes, Dr. Lott has done research on that, yes. You can find information on that at crimeresearch.org. When it comes to the Second Amendment claim, uh, people will frequently say, well, we need it as a uh, defense against tyranny. Whether it's one individual, a small mob, or even someone as big as governments, uh, to which the response is, well, guns can't defeat these major armies that have nukes and tanks. How do you respond to that? Look, I think that anyone and everyone that is a law-abiding adult, if they want to own firearms, and quite frankly, whatever firearm you want, I, I, I don't believe that an AR-15 is more dangerous than a nine millimeter handgun. Um, look, if you're a good, decent person, um, I think that you should have the ability to pre protect yourself and your loved ones the way that you see fit. And, um, you know, th this stuff about, well, you think, you know, you should be able to own a tank. Well, you know what, if you've got the money for it and you're a law abiding citizen, why not? Quite frankly, I actually have a contact here in Tennessee that owns several tanks. Well, uh, the, the uh, administration is too busy uh, leaving billions of uh, dollars of arms with the Taliban. So th they're just terribly afraid that, uh, th that American uh, people might access these things. The Taliban, they're happy to give them. No one gets prosecuted, but they leave the weapons behind for the Taliban and uh, no, one, uh, no one gets in trouble. What are some of the uh, biggest misconceptions that the average person, the average voter has about guns or gun control? Well, I think one thing that the average citizen thinks is that uh, background checks really work. They, they really, really work. And we should have universal background checks. Sounds like a great idea. Sounds reasonable. Until you realize, and this actually just happened to a, a friend of mine the other day. His uh, son went to purchase a firearm. Now, his son is in the military. His son has, you know, like clear the, the special clearances, you know, he's obviously a law abiding person and he went to a, a Bass Pro to purchase a firearm, filled out the 4473 form for the background check and he was denied. Wow. And this happens more than you would think. Uh, it happens quite often, actually, when you hear the Democrats say, oh, you know, three million people that were prohibited were prevented from, you know, uh, purchasing firearms. We kept the bad guys from getting them. That's simply not true. The majority of denials on the next background check are false positives. In other words, they are good law abiding people who are being mistaken for prohibited people. And it's mostly because their names are phonetically similar or they're not using all of the information that is on the 4473 form to go and check and make sure that they're checking the right person. And um, so now his son is going to have to go and appeal that and try to get it cleared up. And there's no telling how long that will take. And some people have to hire an attorney to get that cleared up. Now, think about that. You're trying to purchase a gun that costs less than maybe $1,000. A retainer fee for an attorney is about $3,500. So what do you think people are going to do? Most yeah. people are going to say, you know, 
I'm just going to do nothing because I can't afford $3,500 just to own one gun. Now think about this too. And I, I, I said this to my friend, I said, imagine, I know that's your son, but let's imagine that, um, you know, this is a daughter and I don't know, she's in her early twenties and she's got an ex that has threatened her, that is stalking her. She's scared and she needs to get a firearm quickly to protect herself. That Nick's denial, you know, may not have a real consequence for some people, but others that truly are in fear for their life and need a gun quickly to protect themselves, that could be the difference between life and death for them. Of course. And on a large scale, it totally changes the incentive. The bad guys know, oh, guns are so hard to come around nowadays with all these background checks. They know that there's going to be uh, less resistance if they try to assault anyone. There's just no common sense on this uh, g uh, on the gun control side. Uh, when it comes to uh, the idea of keeping uh, guns out of the hands of, let's say, bad guys, of course, this now then allows the government to define bad guys even further. Uh, are there any ideas that the Crime Prevention Research Center has as far as keeping guns out of uh, the cycles of the world, uh, including politicians, I guess? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, there are already laws on the books right now in every state in this country. And they're involuntary commitment laws. Different states call them different things, but like Florida calls it the Baker Act. And uh, I actually testified before the U.S. Senate against red flag laws. And I, I told them, I said, look, just use the laws that are already existing. If you truly believe that someone is a danger to themselves or others, if you truly believe that and you have real evidence of that, then you can have them essentially Baker acted or whatever the law is in whatever state. But um, what happens is you will submit your proof, your evidence, and then that person would be put on a hold for 72 hours. Mental health experts are involved if they can't afford an attorney and an attorney is provided for them. They actually go before the judge and they plead their case and the judge will hear both sides. Now the judge may say, you know what? This is crazy. You're normal. There's nothing wrong with you. Somebody is just doing this to mess with you. Um, you know, go home. Um, but you know, a judge may say, you know what? You've, you've got some real issues and there's a real concern. That judge has a lot of different options. You know, that person, can be involuntarily committed if needed. They can get out outpatient, you know, psychological therapy. Um, guns can be taken out of the home at that point if needed. But you know, there's due process is what I'm saying. You're 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 innocent until you're proven guilty. With red flag laws, it's the opposite. You are guilty. They go ahead and take your guns first until you can prove that somehow you're innocent. And, you know, that's not the way things are supposed to work in this country. And red flag laws, if you can't afford an attorney, oh, well, you're out thousands of dollars to go and hire one for yourself. And mental health experts are not always involved. So I absolutely am against uh, red flag laws. Uh, I think that it, it's unconstitutional. And um, I, I don't, think that it's really going to solve any problems uh, with, you know, those who have mental issues um, from getting their hands on, on guns. Quite frankly, the family, the family of my stalker uh, knew and his friends and coworkers knew for years. I learned during the trial that he showed signs of real danger for years and people just overlooked it. They could have Baker acted him. You know, if someone had stood up and said, you know what? We think he's dangerous. and We're going to have to do something about this. But they didn't. So guess what? He had no criminal record. He had no record of, you know, mental health issues. And he was able to get his hands on a gun. 
But oh. quite frankly, he could have run us over with his truck. When the police searched his vehicle at the crime scene, they found two more guns, ammunition, a baseball bat, binoculars, gloves, rope, and a knife. He had a lot of ways to harm us. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's horrible. And then they, uh, that they take away the, uh, victim's ability to, uh, to, to defend themselves. That, that's where all of, uh, the, the, the effort, uh, g goes into when it comes to changing minds of people who advocate, uh, gun control, have you found, uh, some things that are really effective and some things that are not effective? Well, you know, the left tends to use emotional arguments and, Look, I get it. Emotional arguments are, I think it's important. I do. Some people are like, oh, it's trash. But that is what makes people really stop and think. Or, you know, but I also think you need facts. Um, you know, and I try to tell people, I'm like, look, you're concerned about mass public shootings. You're concerned about all of this gun violence. I don't like that term. It, to me, it's violence. You know, Stop focusing on the object being used and, and focus on the behavior. It's violence. Um, but, you know, 94% of mass public shootings occur in gun-free zones. People assume that evil people, bad guys are stupid. I'm like, no, they can actually be very intelligent. And a lot of them, uh, if you read their manifestos, you'll see that these sickos plan this stuff months, sometimes years in advance. And um, I think gun-free zones are an open invitation. You know, it's like, hey, come on in. You know, nobody here can protect themselves. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, they want to get a high body bag count. They want to make the news. They want to be famous. They want to go out with a bang. And what better place to do that than a gun-free zone? Exactly. And all of these statistics certainly would uh, c come back to our side. I mean, are you familiar with democide, death by government? <laughs> this is bigger than any of the, you know, quote, mass shooters. Of course, they're really murderers because a shooting is something that people do every day and no one is harmed at all. That They call it shooting so they could vilify the gun. But when it comes to death by government with wars outside of wars, killing civilians, it doesn't even come close. So this is who they think should have uh, total control of uh, of the weapons. Miss um, Gosar, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Where is the best place for people to find the book? Yeah, you can find my book at Amazon, and it's also at Barnes & Noble online. Links will be in the description below. Thanks to everyone for watching the Jews for the Preservation of Firearms Ownership. YouTube and Odyssey channel. Miss Gosar, thank you for your time. Thank you, Keith. Appreciate it.